Hello friends and music lovers, welcome to Piano Insights. My name is Clive Swansbourne and today we'll be looking at the Moonlight Sonata, the first movement of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. One of the most famous five minutes or so of piano music in the whole world and one of Beethoven's most popular pieces. The piece is very revolutionary for certain reasons. This is the first movement of a sonata and what you'd usually would have expected would be an allegro and a fairly sizable movement which kind of dominates the whole composition. The other movements being somewhat less of an importance than the, um, the first movement. But Beethoven switches that around. He decides in this piece to put the biggest movement last and this movement, which is comparatively short and very similar in mood all the way through without the usual contrasts of sonata form movements, first. So it's very unusual in that way. And he calls the piece uh, Sonata Quasi Una Fantasia, which means um, a fantasy. It's a, a sonata, but it resembles a fantasy. And a fantasy in those days, at least, was a piece which was kind of through composed and apparently improvised. We think of the fantasies by Mozart, particularly there's a famous one in D minor and then one in C minor, both of which are very freewheeling and um, uh, give the impression of being improvised. This doesn't really give the impression of being improvised, I don't think, but it's um, held together. There are no gaps between the movements and um, it's through, it's played all the way through without a break. All right, so this first movement a lot of people think it's called the Moonlight Sonata and therefore it's romantic and peaceful and gentle and all that. And I think that that's a, a mistake to think that way because, um, <clears throat> in fact, Beethoven didn't call it the Moonlight Sonata. Well, I think it's not time for cats, really. Um, Beethoven didn't call it the Moonlight Sonata. It was called the Moonlight Sonata by a poet called Rellstab. Several years after Beethoven died, Rolstab was wandering by a lake and thought of the Moonlight Sonata and somehow the word stuck, one of these magical things. It entered the language and uh, stayed there. And so everybody has thought since then of beautiful moonlit, peaceful, cool night and so forth. I don't think that's what Beethoven had in mind at all. In fact, it seems very clear that what Beethoven did have in his mind at that time was the a scene in the... Mozart Don Giovanni opera, uh, towards the beginning of the opera, where the commendatore is killed in a duel by the rake, Don Giovanni, who had tried to rape his daughter. And so he's trying to defend his daughter's honor and kill the rake and gets killed instead. And during his death scene, he sings a few last words to the accompaniment of triplets that are almost identical to the ones we find in the Moonlight Sonata. And from his sketchbooks, we can see that he had this in his mind while he was sketching this piece. And so there's death here. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a sad piece. It's a, it's a piece inspired by a scene of death anyway in opera. So we have to think that it's generally probably pretty dark and not lit by moonlight at all. It's basically the mood is dark and it remains so all the way through the piece. One thing about this piece is that the rhythm never changes. It's these consistent triplets all the way through. It's like a perpetual mobile. Uh, it never changes. So the contrasts that we expect to find in a first uh, movement of a sonata, we don't find in this piece. It is, I mean, uh, it is in a kind of sonata form. There is a structure to it, so it's not wholly fantasia-like. It's not just a series of ideas that don't connect with each other. It is held together pretty well, but it, it does have a very little contrast. Beethoven has very specific marking at the top, adagio sostenuto, which means obviously it's slow and sustained, but also he <coughs> writes in Italian something that could be roughly translated. This whole piece must be played very delicately and with pedal. Well, some people have taken that to mean that you hold the pedal down all the way through. I think that's rather bizarre that anyone should think that that's what Beethoven meant, partly because it sounds ridiculous. Um, 
uh, particularly on the modern piano, it sounds a complete train wreck if you do that. And even though it sounds bizarre and muddy and just completely fogged up, uh, even famous pianists have suggested that this is Beethoven as a revolutionary composer trying something completely new. I just don't see it that way at all. It's, it would be completely out of character for Beethoven to have done that. And it's not an impressionist piece. It's a dark uh, and serious piece. It's almost like a lament or a funeral march even. In fact, if we think of the, uh, the Chopin funeral march, it reminds us a little bit of the, the repeated note figure at the beginning of this piece. probably do better to think funereal thoughts here rather than impression, impressionistic scenes of foggy London or smoggy Bonn or whatever. I think London was actually not quite smoggy yet. We weren't into the industrial age yet. But fog is not what he had in his mind here. What Beethoven obviously means is you use pedal all the way through but he doesn't remind you that you have to change it. Beethoven didn't mark pedal markings in his pieces very often and the only time he ever did was for places where you wouldn't expect that pedaling you wouldn't you wouldn't have thought of it yourself such as in the Waldstein Sonar he has this beautiful theme um, and he doesn't change he asks you not to change pedal he goes he doesn't ask you to change there which you'd expect Sorry. And you'd have the change of the pedal on the change of harmony. He, do, he says, no, don't do that. And you get that beautiful bell-like sound, like bells, you know, ringing bells. They ring their tones and they, they don't get damped out. You just hear a wonderful sonority come out. And that works beautifully well. But here, where you have all these different harmonies uh, melding and the, it's much more complicated and much lower down the piano, it doesn't work at all to keep the pedal down. And why didn't he use pedal markings? Because he just didn't. In fact, in those days, the only way to mark a pedal change was to write the words consordino, and then when you change pedal, when you lifted up the pedal, senza sordina, and then consordino. It's, it was far too complicated to do that. So that's the, the logical uh, inference that we should take from, from his marking. He just says, don't dry the sonority ever. Don't, don't play anything without pedal. But obviously change the pedal as you go along. to say about this. The very beginning of the piece, I recommend using the arm to control these triplets and the whole hand, not, not one, two, three here, but one, three, five. The reason for that is you're able to relax the hand. It's not stretched out like this. This is not kept sort of waiting for action. Yeah, it doesn't need, there is no action in this part of the hand, in this part of the, the keys yet. So we can use the whole hand and we can use the arm to control the G sharps. Notice how, even though he doesn't mark crescendo here, he doesn't, again, he, he doesn't do much marking of dynamics either. He sort of says sempre pianissimo. Obviously, 
It's not going to be sempre in pianissimo all the way through. That means always very soft. He even marks crescendos in it. So one has to, you know, be a little bit uh, interpretive with this piece and not just follow the exact, uh, the exact um, instructions by Beethoven because there aren't enough of them. You have to make up your own or at least go with the harmonic flow. I think harmonies, in a lot of music, the harmonies give the game away. We look for the character of the harmonic changes and respond accordingly. Like here, for example, he's moving out of the minor. Most of this piece is in this dark minor key, but when he moves out of the minor, we should respond to that. Very subtly though. So here we have um, the second measure of the minor key, and then it goes to the major. into the darkness. So here we just have a slight ray of sunshine. You, know, you can just open up a little bit. It's not much at all. And so you can open up a little bit and then you can sink back into the, the darkness of the minor key. And when you get to the, finally when you get to um, this part, then you have to use, you can't use the whole hand anymore you need the pinky for. Now the most, diff the most difficult thing and the most important thing here is the balance. If you're too thumb heavy it, it's not going to work. No. It's got to sound like a bell on top here. So the balance has to be this. So the, a good idea is to practice first with two hands, just this part. If you play, you can immediately tell the difference if it's wrong. You have to get it the same as you did with the two hands. So the idea is to bring this out, lean the weight of the hand towards the pinky, while hardly doing anything here in the thumb, just basically just touching it very lightly. Practice first by not uh, playing anything in, in the thumb. Just Touch the key, but don't play it. See, I'm, I'm touching the key, and then touch it a little bit more. All I'm doing here is this. You see, but I'm doing that up here. It's quite difficult to do, but once you get the knack, it's there for good, you know, uh, but it is important to get that and really practice it. And after that, obviously, these two have to be quite soft. They've, we've been quite, you can open up there, but by the time we've got here, really quite soft and very close to the keys. Don't even lift the hand off the keys. Keep the fingers on the keys and then move the arm, you see. And when you're doing the repeated notes here, I would do arm down and give it a little kick and then arm down again. And when you bring the arm down, bring it down so that most of the weight goes down onto the pinky. Now, looking again for the next major chord, uh, I wouldn't say it opens up this time, but it, it, it shows a contrast between this minor chord, which has a little bit of a bite to it, and that minor chord, and then this one. It's because of the nature of the chord, it's a much warmer chord, it's in the major key. It's different from this. It's this. It's just more, uh, it's warmer, you see. And so reflect that in your playing. Try to make a difference in character in the sound between the two chords. This one.
ways of playing this. I mean, if you've got a big hand, this is no problem. But um, I'm holding the pedal down through it anyway. But this is, even for a big hand, that's you know, it's not the most comfortable thing to use all these thumbs. So you can either do this, which is very comfortable as long as you don't jam that down too loud. And certainly don't do that, don't split it up. That, that doesn't sound good at all. When you get to this chord, just another quick tip here. Uh, it's a mistake to lift, uh, change the pedal too quickly or, or lift up the finger too quickly. If you do this, you lose that. And this becomes a staccato note. So hold on to it, hold on to it. And then the next measure goes to the minor. sink into that say is we're back in dark territory now and don't you don't you ignore it so don't just sail through it that's not interesting whereas this has much more presence again Beethoven is shifting between major and minor there's very little major and when when it goes back to the minor you kind of are reminded of it you see now here to the major again so maybe doesn't last long at all you see C major how optimistic is that you know so we can we can at least seem to be a little bit brighter aiming for that Actually, I think quite effectively use limited pedal on this change of harmony. I like that clash with this still sounding. I prefer it to all you get is that I think it's more interesting to go and so you really hear, hear a much more of a shriek of pain when it's clap when all of this is clashing on top uh, so I would suggest that you don't have to do it though and then here in the left hand but really grip that one and get a good landing on that if you have to take this with the left hand in other words, don't if you don't if you can't reach this, don't do this. That doesn't work at all. So do it with the do the longer pedal and use the left hand. Like that. And then change there, maybe. Or half change. You don't really need to change much here. You can use you can use a fairly generous pedal along here. Beautiful descending phrase. And it's going to the darkest part of the piece. You see? So don't play it with this balance. All soloistic, no. Lots of thick, dark. Yeah. 
dance is crescendo. That's probably the loudest one in the piece. recommend using soft pedal in this piece. I think the, the tone of the piece, the nature of the piece requires um, uh, no feeling of dolce really. It's too espressivo. It's too racked with kind of painful and tragic maybe. Maybe tragic's a little, a little uh, too dramatic sounding but at least it's very dark and quite sad. So I, I wouldn't use dolce. <clears throat> There's nothing terribly calming uh, in this piece for the most part. So here at least we're in some kind of neutral territory. It seems to this is the part that really sounds improvised, and so it's not. It, it seems kind of uh, like it's heading home, but it's not there yet. It's just wandering, slightly dreamy even. We're going to take the soft pedal up here as we do a slight crescendo. wonderful part I think of the piece this where it's it sinks down bring out these that's the saddest part I think favorite chord in the entire piece I think it's like a balm on the wound you know suddenly a salve to all that pain and then we're going home and we're home you see back to where we were before in the piece and he manages to make home sound like a comforting place uh, because of all this despair before it. So here again we have this magical appearance of an A major chord after all this minor stuff. And then of course it's only one major chord because then we're immediately... But this major chord is has to be just the right color and not sailed through at all. It must be some sort of, don't highlight it. Maybe, maybe use a soft pedal if, if the piano, sometimes soft pedal you have to be careful because if it softens things too much, uh, you have to know your piano uh, if it just sounds like cotton wool. Sometimes putting it down halfway is a good thing to do if it doesn't soften it quite as much. Um, on the, con on the uh, flip side of that, if you have a piano which is exceedingly bright and too clangorous and you simply can't get it, it's one of those pianos which is very hard to play soft on at all, then you might need to use more soft pedal and, and experiment with trying halfway down. Um, sometimes that can do the trick. Every piano is different in their regulation of the, of the soft pedal and so you have to pretty much uh, you know, know your piano all right, well, that takes us to the recapitulation, and um, I'll just make a quick uh, suggestion for the 
the last line uh, it has uh, we have the coda here whereas the tune is in the bass now here I'd let, leave the pedal down Now, I think I messed that up because I sort of held the, held the whole chord and then decided to release it. And I think you can either do it, Beethoven was quite, uh, he often used long pedals at the end of pieces uh, to hold the whole harmony. Here is a, you could do that here. And then keep the pedal down there and then play the last two chords. But on the other hand, if you're going to clear out the pedal here, I'd do it immediately. One, two, three. And do a writ, count a writ through there. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two. One, two, three, four, five, six, one. So it's not just absolutely on time. There's a, a, a certain emotional weight that this piece has carried on its back. And when it does come finally to rest, it needs time. <laughs> it needs time for that rest before moving on. So wait as long as you like on this last chord. Just don't fidget, don't move. Meditate on it. We're, we're finally at rest here and there's no hurry to come up at all and then when you do release don't make a big deal obviously just release it wait and then move to when I say there's there's no gap between the two these two moves um, he marks attacca subito il seguente which means attach it immediately go straight to the next movement but it doesn't mean you can't have, I mean, you don't have to go straight like that. You can have a, a tiny gap before moving to the next movement. Thank you for listening. Um, I hope if you like this, you will uh, press a like and uh, subscribe and share. And I hope to see you in the next movements of this piece. Bye-bye.